Thank you, Mike. Yep. Thank you, Barbara, Ellen, Sasha, Kara, and the latest trend having all white conferences. Thank you for breaking that mold. When we have diversity in our conferences and diversity on our boards and diversity in our schools, then we have diversity in our design firms and diversity in our industry. And it makes all the work better and it makes the world a much better place. I am the co-founder of OCD. the original champions of design. We uh, are a design company that focuses on brand identity systems. That's what we do, and we do it because that's what we love. We started our company eight, nine years ago, in 2010, eight years ago. Uh, and we're right here in the East Village, New York City. And we've been there from the very beginning. Uh, and it's eight people in a room. Eight people in a room doing pretty extensive brand identity systems for clients big and small. Um, and some of that is what I'm going to take you through today. But I'd be lying if I said that we were doing it alone, just us eight people, because it actually takes all of you to help us do that work. Uh, and what I'm going to show you today is how it's taken a lot of bad motherfucking type designers to help us get this shit done. Now, with uh, some of what we do, we develop these brand identity systems. And as you know, the typical thing to do, and as, as Sasha has been doing with, with um, recently and, and others, and kind of showing. Uh, work in, in, the, in the world of standards manuals. What we did with the Girl Scouts of the USA, which was one of the first projects that we launched with, uh, in, in building the brand identity system, was uh, we developed this here, which is called, uh, we called it the cheat sheet. And we did it because we, we wanted to uh, deliver something more than just the files. We wanted a print piece, something that we could hand over to the client. Um, and it's basically a snapshot of the full identity system. But a lot of people will think with identity systems and with branding, the, the, the hierarchy of things that you would think of in a brand is the logo. The logo is what you deliver to a client. But as most of you know, the type is very, very high on that hierarchy list. I mean, when you look here, what's one of the first things you see? You see that eight key questions to ask yourself when building a Girl Scout branded piece. And that's set in the brand typeface. So that's what I'm going to walk you through today, is how all of the brands that we work with, the type is such an important component to it. So I'll start with what we did for advertising age. I'll take you a little bit through our process. And our process isn't that unlike what Mike just did with, with, with Batman. We start from the very beginning. We do a research phase, and this is a lot of what it looks like. So with advertising age, we learned they had been around since the 1930s. And so when we learned that, the first thing we then said is, well, do you have an archive? And they did. So out in Detroit, a little bit outside of Detroit, they had this big warehouse with all of these different files and all of these different books full of all of the, these different materials. And as you can see, in the world of advertising, they're following trends. So all of these mastheads, all of these logos at the top of these, these newspapers, these tabloid newspapers, uh, every single thing changed depending on how the wind was blowing that day. You know, so you had this and that and that and this, and you know, it was 80s, it feels like the 90s, it feels like the 70s. Uh, and then we started to look back in other files, and we learned that they actually had a, an interesting uh, mix of type. They had this, this mix of type that 
this, uh, they were using, they were pulling a lot of different type choices and, and this eclectic mix, so they, they knew type and typography, so that's something that we could actually leverage. They were advertisers. There were a bunch of people that understood branding, and there were some icons, and there were some other things there that we, we, we knew that they could understand. But the one thing that they had been doing since the very, very beginning is data. They were doing data before people knew what analytics was. So that's something that stood out to us. And advertising age was important. Uh, they had big advertising, ad, advertising in the, the, the actual book, in the magazine. They even advertised in their own magazine. And in that, it stood out because of its color, because of the type. So these are all things that we learned in our research phase, in, in researching this brand. Now, you know, with advertising, one thing that's kind of interesting is uh, they, sometimes you, you get these copywriters that know really how to wrap something up in a, in a short and easy way and in, in an eloquent way, but then sometimes you can get a little carried away. And so they wanted to think of themselves as being industry badasses. And so what they ended up doing is calling themselves industry badasses. But you know, as soon as you start calling yourself a business badass or an industry badass, the last thing you are is a badass. And what we ended up doing is in that dive in the archive, when we had to come up with a way to move them into a new world, we said, you know what, don't call yourself a badass anymore because that just actually sums up that you're not a badass. But in your history, we learned that you were actually being, acting more like a badass because you weren't calling yourself a badass. You were just saying, you know what, this is important stuff to important people. And that more embodies what you want to, that you're, what you're trying to say. So why don't we actually go back to what you were doing then and see if we can move that more in a, in a forward-facing way. So maybe we can use that, something that we learned from the, from the past. We also loved that first, that first uh, logo that you saw there. So this is that timeline. So we pulled out some of those logos that you saw on the, on the front of those pages there. And uh, we went back from the very beginning. We moved up into what you, what you then will see. But this is the very first issue of advertising age. And then moving them forward, we had to understand that history. And we started at the very beginning here. And uh, it has this sans serif typeface at the top. And so what we then did is we wanted to think if we can shorten this advertising age, everybody just called it ad age. And so we did. And we called on one of our favorite type design friends. As I mentioned, we can't do this alone. So uh, Tobias Frere Jones, maybe you've heard of him, uh, to come and help us out. And so Tobias helped us to redraw the masthead, the logo, uh, into this shortened logo for ad age. So the thing that stood out here, as you can tell, you have that fairly warm, open, sans serif uh, uh, typeface, but then that G and even the E are quite distinctive. And then that gets pulled into a brand book or guidelines document, and it fits there really nicely at the top. So that G becomes almost like this clip, so you can really hold information in a nice, easy way. So this is actually how it works. So some of the things that we, we, uh, we touched on, you see this, this A, this nice high t uh, cap height, so it's a, it's a lot warmer, a bit more modern than what was there in the very beginning. Uh, you kept some of those details of that E, and that G is so distinctive. That can be used in a way here where it's stacked. That can be used definitely something we had to consider in social media. And what happened when we did this is the Ad Age team really embraced this move, uh, starting with their legacy, but moving into the future. I mean, they really embraced it. And when you start to, to get the team involved, when you're working with uh, the, the management, when you're working with all the people and you, you're teaching them along the way, when you get the type designers and you're, you're, the type designers are helping you to, to show the, the, uh, the, the client why you're making certain decisions and, and how this is 
uh, these design decisions aren't just, once again, trend-based. This is something that's, that's there from the, the core. Then, um, then everybody really, you know, they really buy into it. And you know, because when you walk into the office, everybody just, you know, they're really, really into it. I mean, literally. So, um, so we built out the full system here. So that ad age stack could work in a full set, and then we could build it out into a full brand. So the brand guidelines, one of the things that ad age saw in their future from a business perspective is that advertising is now shifting more into uh, brand. So they see branding as the future of their business. And at the core of branding is design. So they say good design as being good for their industry. Tobias and his team uh, helped us not only develop that, uh, that word mark for ad age, but then we started to uh, leverage uh, retina and exchange as, as typefaces uh, for the website and the, and the publication as well. We were able to customize it a little bit to uh, have it sync up with uh, some of the qualities of, of the word mark as well as work for legibility. And now we have a full set of materials that works not just with the logo, but in, inside all of the pieces as well. Color became very important for the brand. So we have this pretty diverse color palette that then could be extended across a lot of different materials. And then we introduced banding because it's a small team, so we needed a, a way for them to be able to quickly be able to design uh, materials for advertising as well as, um, as well as the magazine. Okay, so moving right along. Uh, we have been working with this brand for a very long time, and they make a lot of different things, as you can see here. And so what we had to do is develop a system that helped to uh, clean up some of these 300 different pieces. And not only had, did we do that, we had to figure out how to make this logo have a little bit more, uh, be a little bit more modern and have a little bit more presence. What we notice here is that you not only say MBA once, but you're saying MBA twice. So how could we clean that up? And, uh, and how could we give them a little bit more presence? So here is where we worked with um, a few other designers, uh, Elizabeth Carey Smith, and, uh, and commercial type to help us develop a taller, slender, more athletic uh, word mark for the MBA. We removed that second logo that was inside of the mark, and then we had the full uh, mark here. And then, moving from this point, we were able to extend uh, this they loved it so much that they said, hey, what can we do for business cards? So we made the logo the business card. <laughs> uh, one of the fun things that we were able to actually do, though, is a subtle thing, but the MBA works with so many partners that we wanted to be able to come up with a, a unique way for them to be able to, to work with partners. And so we just took a little piece of the logo and used this dot or the ball as the connector when they're working with partners. So you can see how that works here. And it's a small little thing, but it's one of my favorite parts of the whole system, where you just have this little dot as the connector. Uh, but back to typography. So we worked with commercial type and Eric Van Blocklin and using action, and we customized it to make it a little bit more special for the MBA. So building on that dot, we, we made all the dots on the eyes, and we made a couple of other tweaks to the, letter, uh, to the, to the numerals to make it a bit more distinctive for an athletics brand. And then we introduced Action as now Action MBA for this uh, team, for this league. We gave them this full mix of type that's tall and slender, just like the athletes. And now all of those different logos that was an individual logo for every single thing is now all uh, based with Action MBA at the core. And not only working with commercial type for uh, Action MBA, but then we worked with commercial type and, uh, and Miguel Reyes at Font Taste to do lettering for MBA Cares and updating Cares. And you know, the crazy thing about the MBA is they're not just you know guys here 
then we have, they say, oh, Bobby, what can we do for our uh, MBA store in, in Dubai? We need, we need to say MBA store in Arabic. And I said, okay, well, you know, I have a student uh, that, uh, uh, an Arabic type designer named Ali Madad. Ali, can you design MBA store in Arabic? He said, yeah, I'd love to do that. So we had him do that. I said, uh, Christian, we need to do a whole set of lettering in, uh, in Chinese. Can we do that? He was like, yeah, we could try that. So we worked on them with that. And then I needed a little bit quicker, so I said, hey, Zipong, Zipong, we need some Chinese lettering. Can you help us that, with that? And he said, oh, yeah. So Zipong Zhu, Christian Schwartz, we did both uh, uh, Chinese, Arabic. You know, I'm multinational nowadays. Um, so you can see how it all comes together with the little LeBron, a little uh, Stefan. So that's how we roll. Uh, so it all comes together with the MBA, with uh, the MBA and, uh, and action, the typeface right at the beginning. So there's eight people in the room doing all this shit, but it's all uh, really done by that much broader network. We just did this for the MBA. We did that for the MBA G League, moving them from the D League to the G League, and we did that with the WNBA. So now this, the family is complete. I'll quickly go through Dartmouth, because I know time is creeping up on me, but, uh, but this is a fun one, especially for the type designers and um, Dartmouth up in the Ivy League world uh, that I didn't know anything about until I actually started a design, design company, then they start calling, but back when I was a high school student, they didn't want nothing to do with me. Um, so Baker Tower, this is their library. Within the library, they actually have, um, a, 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 um, they have type, uh, metal type, uh, and then they have a special archive library where we started working with Dartmouth, I mean, and we went in and we said, hey, can you pull a whole bunch of things from the archive? So we went in just like with Ad Age, and they had all this stuff on the, on the table. So we started looking at all of these different things. They pulled out all the stuff, and we started grabbing all of them, looking at the iconography, looking at the type, looking at the seal, uh, just beautiful, beautiful stuff. The thing is, when you first start working with a client, you have no clue what you're actually looking at. So we looked at, like, they had uh, Xeroxes of this, and, like, I didn't know what this was, but I knew that the lettering around this was really interesting, and we said, oh, maybe there's something we can leverage from this. And so when we started to develop an identity for these guys, we said, okay, maybe we can get a type designer to help us with this. So we called up one of our friends, uh, Jesse Reagan, and we said, Jesse, hey, we're working with Dartmouth, there's some type and there's some iconography that we, we want to work with these guys on. And Jesse said, well, you know, it's funny that you say that. There's this guy named Rudolf Rizika that I've been studying for like eight years, and he's from, he lives, lived up in Hanover, and he's been studying type and developing type for Dartmouth's metals and their, uh, and their metals and their coins and a lot of iconography up at Dartmouth for many, many years. And I was like, oh, Rudolf Rizika, hold on. Razika symbol, it all came together. I didn't even realize until we were talking with the type designer, put two and two together, that, you know, sometimes things just happen like that. So what we ended up doing is we worked with Jesse to develop a word mark for Dartmouth that was inspired by the original type studies that Rudolf Razika had done. Then from there, we were able to develop the, the word mark, a variety of colors in the color scheme, uh, the full palette of patterns. Uh, then we learned about John Scottford, who had done this, this symbol. And the symbol was you know, uh, based on what they call the lone pine. And so we were able to update that. Using the D into the pine, we came up with the new logo for Dartmouth, uh, which now flies up on their campus. And you know, one of the hard parts about working with a college is getting students to embrace it, which is still a challenge, especially students that are there now. But it always helps when you have, is there sound here? Like, look at the new logo, the D-Pine. It's, it's beautiful. It reminds me of what college-age Mindy thought a marijuana lease might look like, but I was too scared to actually find out. So it helps a little bit. Uh, so then Jesse actually developed, based on another typeface from uh, Rudolf Rizika, we developed a full set of light, uh, extra light, light regular, full family of typefaces and italics. 
uh, for Dartmouth. And we love this. This is a typeface that they use, the serif typeface, in conjunction with the word mark. And then we pair that with the sans serif because they say, oh, well, we use serif all the time and we're going to look old and dusty. So we say, okay, well, we'll pair, give you a sans, well, sans serif as well. So this is national too. Uh, so they can use them together in, uh, in as many different ways as they need. All right. Again, when you think about the hierarchy of brands, a lot of times you think of the logo. But here, the things that stand out, that word mark, type, type based, and typography is key. When you're doing communications and messaging, the type is core to the brand. So one more thing that I'll talk about, it's less of a big brand thing, but something that was really close to our heart. We approached it very similar to how we approached our work for Ad Age, the MBA in Dartmouth. We started with research. The Atlantic called, and I, I know I only have a couple of minutes, but the Atlantic called, and they said, hey, Bobby, um, we have this, this project where we want to do a, a, a magazine issue for um, the Martin Luther King 50th anniversary of uh, Martin Luther King's uh, death. So April 4th, uh, 2018, it had been 50 years since he was passing. And so we'd like to do a special issue. We'd love if OCD would design it for us. And we said, okay, sure. So we started with some research. Uh, this is uh, that iconic photo of the Memphis sanitation workers. Um, but what we did is we actually went back into the history. We looked at as many magazine covers and uh, album covers and things that actually use uh, Martin Luther King's photo on the cover or typographic references, Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine, Newsweek, Time, Life, The New Yorker, uh, Illustration. And we tried to gather as much reference points from the past as we could. And then we had to think about what the Atlantic looked like now. And then this is what special issues for the Atlantic look like. So the Atlantic had done it for JFK, they had done it for World War I, they had done it for the Civil War. So this is the world that we were living in, but we also knew that we had to think about what it was going to be up against when this went, went out into the newsstands. And so what we started to do, this is the interior, so we had to so keep some of that DNA, but also move it a little bit further. So we, we wanted to make sure that we honored uh, what was happening at the time, but also thought about how we could stand out. So typographically, we, uh, we worked with commercial type and uh, Christian sent over a typeface called Kaslan Dork, which we love because it referenced subtly some of the type on, on those placards. Uh, this, is some, this is from a Jet magazine, and so we picked uh, Fournier from uh, Typhonderry and uh, Stefan Elbetz. And then this is a telegram from one of the stories. Uh, this is it's not a story. It's from a letter from King. This is actual, and uh, I'll let you read it. It's pretty brilliant. Uh, but we chose pitch from, uh, from Clem to kind of reference that, that um, typewriter-esque font. And this is what we ended up doing. So for the cover, we used that Caslon Dork, really big and bold, so it felt like the logo for the magazine itself. We wanted it to feel like the masthead. Um, we wanted it to also feel very um, uh, almost crown-like. And then one of the big things that we did here is we cropped in on the image of King. We wanted to focus on him as, a, as like celebrating the life and words of King, so we focused on him and his face and his mouth and, uh, and focused on the people that were speaking. And then on the back, we have the quote. So this wraparound image, you can see the cover front and back. And then interior, bold. It, we use a lot of the, the actual ephemera from our research. We introduce quotes. Uh, we work with artists a lot, so we were able to reach out to Hank Willis Thomas and say, can we use the, some of the, your work through the pieces? And then they were divided up in four sections. The man, which we made feel like a placard. Contrast that with a, a fairly busy timeline. We reached out to a young letterer named Ade Hogue out of Chicago. Uh, this brother was able to do this for us literally over uh, Martin Luther King weekend. 
And uh, we had to, this was like one of the last stories to get in because this was actually a Q&A with uh, Congressman John Lewis. And so he, he had more important things to do, like do everything he could to resist Trump. So we would say, okay, we'll wait. Get the work done. Get the work done. Uh, this, was, this is a spread from, uh, this is the eulogy uh, from Benjamin Mays. And so we wanted this to feel a little bit more reverent and somber. somber. So we switched it up a bit. This is all in pitch, uh, introducing King's uh, three evils. Uh, we built this out on a modular grid that could shift depending on what we were referencing, dividing it up with another uh, all typographic uh, divider page for racism. We wanted racism to feel a little bit jarring, like teeth biting. And uh, opening up with some white space. And uh, then when we got to the vote page, we wanted to make sure that we showed that, yes, folks, King voted and he led people to, to the voting booths, so make sure you get out and vote this time. Uh, and then we made vote as big as possible. We would have put it on the cover if they would have allowed us to. In our divider pages, we shifted the pages. So we went from really big and bold uh, to black and white. With, when we got to poverty, we wanted to feel a little bit smaller, a little bit more um, uh, meager. Uh, and actually, we did the contrast of a white page and a black page because it was very much about racism and segregation at the time. That was what the fight was about. Uh, it contrasted that with a fairly busy page. And we were making all of this up as we go. Uh, we were designing this literally like over the holidays, over the weekends, because it's a, a really quick timeline, a really quick turnaround. Uh, we would do fun, interesting uh, little, maybe inside um, kind of references. So on this still separate but equal, it was important for us to do this thing that maybe nobody even cares about, but just to have this, this uh, center column that was, that was really open so it actually separated the, the type, typographic columns. Um, because it was about uh, still separate and unequal. Trying to get as much white space as possible. Switching up the, to a, a much more intricate uh, grid for, for this, because we were trying to, we, we had to fit all of the copy in a certain amount of pages, which was probably the toughest challenge for uh, a brand-based design team now working on a, a magazine. It's like, you mean we've got to get all of that into this? Um, okay, so uh, for militarism, big and bold. And what was really fun about working with Paul Spella and David Somerville at The Atlantic is they, they were great. The, the whole editorial team was just saying, yes, OCD, more, more, more. So we were, like, with, when we showed them the cover, they, was, they loved it and they would give us just good constructive criticism. When we did pages like this, uh, this was for an article. This was actually the article that the uh, telegram was used for. Uh, a letter from Birmingham jail is the actual, is, is the story. But the Atlantic had published this letter years before. And when they published it, uh, it was originally called uh, the, the Negro is Your Brother. And so we wanted to get that as big and bold as possible. And, uh, and so we said, well, what if we ran that across uh, all three spreads? They'll never let us do this. And then Paul came back and said, yeah, man, let's do it. And I said, wow, really? You want to work for some of our other clients? Uh, so it was just great to be able to work with such a team that was really encouraging and, and super supportive throughout this whole process and just allowing us to, uh, to, to come up with some fairly um, provocative ideas for a, an issue that could be um, uh, a little bit uh, I guess you could could go fairly safe with it, but we were we were definitely trying to push it to make sure that it stood out and was memorable and was something that we were would be really proud of. All all four of the openers together, and then some of the inside spreads. Uh, so working with brands, working with uh, big brands, type is there at the core. It's something we love to do. The systems. Um, I hope it comes through. People always talk about logos and how logos are important. You see the logo on social, you see the logo here, and they are important, but they can't do any of that without the type. We couldn't do any of this without the type, 
and we couldn't do any of this without you all. So thank you very much for having me today.